Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. Who was Steve Jobs? That seems to be the question that has swirled around pop culture since his death in 2011. Everyone knows he made a big contribution to the world we know today, but who was he really? Hey, whether it's through documentaries such as the recently released Steve Jobs, The Man in the Machine, or countless books, some authorized but most unauthorized, and all of them disputed by various parties as inaccurate, to narrative films. Everyone wants to get a handle on the true man, just so they can wax poetic on his impact. But really, what was so great about Steve Jobs? Take it away, comedian Bill Burr! I didn't get it. I didn't get the big deal they made about that guy. When he died, they were like, he changed the world. He changed the world. The world was one way, and then Steve Jobs came, and it was another. What did he do? Somebody, for the love of God, what the f did that guy do? What did he do? He told other people what to invent? I want my entire music collection in that phone. Get on it! Thank you, Bill Burr. Let's put it a different way. Let's use the words of the character of Steve Wozniak as he puts it to Steve Jobs himself in the spectacular new film, Steve Jobs. You can't write code. You're not an engineer. You're not a designer. You can't put a hammer to a nail. I built the circuit board. The graphical interface was stolen from Xerox Park. Jeff Raskin was the leader of the Mac team before you threw him off his own project. Everything, someone else designed the box. So how come 10 times in a day, I read Steve Jobs as a genius? What do you do? The world loves his products. So hence, the world loves him and wants to get to know him better. They search for answers. They want to know who was Steve Jobs. Well, I can tell you from having watched Steve Jobs, The Man in the Machine, and Steve Jobs, the film I'm here to talk to you about today, it's impossible to pin him down. Like all of us, he was a complicated guy, difficult to summarize, and he was many different things to many different people. So wisely, the new film by the dream team of Oscar-winning writer Aaron Sorkin and Oscar-winning director Danny Boyle doesn't even try. It also doesn't try to educate us by teaching us something new about the man or to summarize his life from cradle to grave, no. Instead, it does something far more worthwhile and refreshing. It takes the things we know and uses them to create a character in a fully dramatic work. Not for one second do I believe that this film attempts to recreate things as they actually happened or portray the people involved as they actually were. And I don't care. Neither should you. I also don't believe that Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine really sparred with such verbal precision, or that Richard III spoke in iambic pentameter. Furthermore, Google Bonnie and Clyde to see how accurate that movie was to real life. Or if you don't want to Google it, you can just ask Siri. Thank you, Steve Jobs. These are dramatized works with notable historical figures as their subject. They shouldn't be beholden to the same standard as documentaries. Even the documentaries about jobs are no help in providing insight, so by all means, don't get held up on the facts. Just sit back and enjoy the show. And what a show it is. Aaron Sorkin is, God, he's gotta be my favorite living writer. A man known for creating the kind of dialogue that reads like a sparring match. In The West Wing, Sports Night, The American President, the newsroom, and his Oscar-winning work on Social Network, he has mastered the art of progressing a conversation to unprecedented levels of intensity, usually climaxing at moments where one character ends up saying something illuminating or intense or unspeakably cruel, and all of the characters on screen, including the one who made the outburst, pause, along with us, each member of the audience, to say to ourselves, did he really just say that? Steve Jobs is full of such moments. Structured like a play, and I believe it would make a very good one, don't be surprised if it gets turned into a play within a few years, 
in three very distinct acts. Steve Jobs takes place backstage. Hmm, Aaron Sorkin writing a piece that takes place behind the scenes. Imagine that. Steve Jobs takes place immediately before the product launches of the Macintosh in 1984, the Next Computer in 1988, and the iMac in 1998. No iPod, no iPhone, no iPad, nothing beyond 1998. Just those three dates. Now, limiting the story in this way means that you are already conditioned to expect that what you're seeing is a heavily distilled and adapted version of real life events. Like I said, there's no way that all these conversations ever happened on the same day, within minutes of each other, or that they even happened at all. So, instead of straining to see the lines between reality and fiction, just sit back and enjoy the verbal fireworks. Aaron Sorkin is operating at the top of his game here. His trademark walk and talk rat-a-tat dialogue is perfectly suited to the intense moments right before a major product launch as everyone scrambles to make presentations ready, advance their agendas, or even just be seen or heard, acknowledged by Steve Jobs, who can be cruel and charming, often in the same sentence. Michael Fassbender is brilliant here, not doing a direct impression of Jobs, but rather creating a character within the narrative. His work, and the work of Kate Winslet as his perpetually frustrated work wife, who's Eastern European accent only comes out when she's upset is just mesmerizing. Director Danny Boyle, the frenetic visual stylist behind Train Spotting, The Beach, and Slumdog Millionaire, does his most restrained work here, just letting the dialogue do its thing and only very infrequently indulging in the wild visual or editing flourishes for which he's known. Yes, he did shoot each act using different film stock to accentuate the passage of time, which is a nice touch, but perhaps inspired by Apple's sleek, simplistic design, he sets up beautiful, striking, and uncomplicated images and relies upon the performances and writing to draw in the viewers. And draw you in, this movie does. Its two hour running time zips by and will leave you exhausted and enthralled. This film is a remarkable dramatic achievement and ballsy. The only comparison I can make is it's what you would get if Orson Welles had had the stones to call his film Citizen Hearst. If he kept everything else the same but just abandoned all pretense and just said, this is a story I'm making about William Randolph Hearst. Rosebud, the unrequited childhood issues, the failed relationships, the dirty politics, and been like, yo, dramatic license, biatch. What you gonna do? Now, am I saying this film is Citizen Kane? No, but it is a remarkable and sophisticated dramatic work built and based around a man that we still don't know very well, but with enough accurate details to make the whole experience feel authentic. I give Steve Jobs my highest marks. Extra large bag of popcorn. This is cultural entertainment of the highest order. See it and you will feel smarter. You won't learn anything about Steve Jobs that you didn't already know, but you will be taken on a journey by a group of artists that know what they're doing and do it better than anyone in the business. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Please subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a single review. Click the thumbs up to indicate you liked what you saw and leave any comments for me below this video. In the meantime, thanks for watching, I'm the Colonel, and just for full disclosure, this entire episode was shot on an iPhone, transferred to a MacBook, and edited on iMovie. Steve Jobs, I salute you.